Hey, it's Joe, and welcome to another episode of the Test Guild Performance and Site Reliability Podcast. And today we'll be talking with Peter Corliss all about the best five factors when selecting a high performance, low latency database, and probably other topics like performance and testing related topics relating to databases, which I think a lot of people may overlook. If you don't know, Peter is the director of the technical advocacy at Cilia DB, and he is the program chair of the annual P99 conference and the Cilia DB Summit. And he hosts Cilia DB's masterclass event series. It's actually where I found him. I think they did a, a masterclass with K6 and Dynatrace. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. So that's why I wanted to have him on the show because I think this is a highly overlooked area, especially when it comes to performance and performance related issues with your testing. So you don't want to miss this episode. Check it out. Hey, Peter, welcome to the Guild. Thanks so very much, Joe. Thanks for having me. Awesome to have you. I guess before we get into it, is there anything I missed in your bio that you want the Guild to know more about? Just one thing. Uh, it, it, we tell people that no matter how you pronounce it, that's the right way of pronouncing it, right? Uh, so, But it's Scylla-DB, uh, kind of like silly, but with an A at the end. So Scylla-DB is the way we normally pronounce it. But I believe that like Homer's Greek, you would have said like Skyla, right? So right. so I'm I'm certainly not a professional in, in ancient Greek. But again, <laughs> however you pronounce it is the right way for us. So Perfect. Scylla-DB. <laughs> that, it was something like silly to me. I'm like, is it Scylla-DB? So that's good to know. Awesome. We're, we're very silly. So it's okay. <laughs> Great. So I guess, Peter, before we get into it, um, as I mentioned, I think a lot of people maybe not think about the database of their application, um, when, especially when it comes to performance. So uh, maybe to set the stage, of how important is uh, figuring out your database architecture or what database you're going to use when you're creating an application as it comes to maybe performance down the road? It's, it's, pretty, it, it's pretty fundamental. It's kind of like a lot of people make important choices around, let's say, their cloud provider, right? That's a key thing because depending upon what cloud provider I'm going to be at, that's going to lock me in for, what, three to five years. Now, you can shift from that cloud vendor, but boy, is that a heavy lift, right? And then after that, you're making other key decisions, uh, what kind of hardware platform are going to run on. Uh, uh, but even then, that's very dependent upon what software you're going to be running on it. And so a key factor there is choosing your database infrastructure because you can swap out a database. And in fact, a lot of the use cases for SillyDB come from a brownfield uh, conversion over something else. But the reason why we're chosen over and over again is because people made a wrong choice somewhere along the way, or they made a, a choice that seemed right for the MVP. And then they hit some throughput uh, 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 or some sort of total data under management. And suddenly the thing was just falling, uh, you know, down around them. And, and like and, and their, their database was pretty much not keeping up with the growth of their business. And that's the worst thing you can do, because now it's a it's a five alarm fire. Uh, you're losing business. Your customers are complaining. And, and, and now you're asking me to swap out the database. So. We're seeing more and more that we want to get ahead of that curve. We want to say, you know, what's the capacity you're looking to run at within a year of beginning? And maybe if you're in your you're past your first year and you're looking, you're planning for years two, three, five, et cetera, you know, what is your scaling requirement? Because I think that we're seeing over and over again, we can save people a lot of headaches if you had started architecting right with something that was going to uh, meet those scaling uh, challenges that you knew you were going to be facing. So when that happens, how do they know to look at Cilia DB? Um... Well, the thing is, is that we're 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 not like if you take a look at there's a site called DB Engines. Uh, dot com DB uh, dash Engines dot com, and this is kind of like the billboard charts. If you've never seen it, it's the billboard charts of databases, right? And DB dash Engines dot com ranks nearly 450 of our closest competitors in the industry. There's tons of databases, of course, starting with Oracle and, as you'd imagine, uh, uh, Microsoft SQL Server, etc. You know, those are the most popular databases. And we're not even until like later in the top hundred. So we're probably not the first thing that people are going to come to. Uh, but there's certain kind of uh, challenges at scale that people would traditionally have turned to, let's say, an Apache Cassandra, right? They know about that. They Or they might have started on uh, all AWS stuff, and they so they, they easily get into DynamoDB. But the problem with uh, Cassandra is that it has a performance lag issue, you know, just in terms of latencies. 
uh, and it, uh, it'll certainly horizontally scale. Um, but but performance wise, you can scale for for uh, for total data under management, but you can't scale latency the same way. You really need to start on a faster system. Uh, and now you're taking a look at something uh, either an you know, in-memory kind of thing, like let's say a Redis, you know, uh, or you're taking a look at a fast persistent store like a SillyDB. Um, Again, that's totally budget driven. Also budget driven is DynamoDB. Very fast sell to get started, but once you start operating at scale, that, that AWS bill is basically like taking all your venture capital, taking that check, turning it over and co-signing it, co it to Jeff Bezos, right? So for people who are trying to contain their spend, uh, we're also seen as a cost effective and performant alternative. Great. So speaking of de determining what database is right for you, uh, you did a webinar recently on the best five factors when selecting a high performance, low latency database. Yes. I thought maybe we dive into each of those and then see where it takes us. Um, so the first one obviously was software architecture. So you mentioned uh, the difference between something like Redis and, and your solution. So what is the architecture? Why do people need to worry about what should they look for when it comes sure. to Sure. I mean, Redis is a great system so yeah. long as, let's say, you're just trying to keep your data in memory and you can afford that and you're operating out of one data center. Right. Because if you have if you want to do a multi data center deployment, that's not Redis's go to. It's kind of an anti pattern for Redis. Right. Uh, whereas, for instance, for SillyDB, you have multi data center uh, um, uh, capabilities built in from the get go. Right. So if you wanted to have, let's say, a Tokyo, Japan, an EU uh, zone and a North America database, and they're all they're all conjoined in a single logical cluster. You can do that easily with SillyDB. It's not like a bolt on like you get with a lot of other databases. And I don't want to pick on anybody. You know, a lot of these people have really good systems to keep, you know, data centers in sync. But that's not the same thing as true multi data center clustering. Does that help with failover? Because I know nowadays with hybrid cloud, everything's moved to the cloud. If one instance goes yeah. down, um, would using your help you go, okay, this is down. We can, you can easily go to the other instance. True story. Uh, uh, where there was an OVH cloud fire uh, not long ago, and they lost an entire data center in Strasbourg. Literally the whole thing burned to the ground. And uh, we had a client who had been running there uh, and all 10 of the nodes that they had running there were slag heap of like uh, metal and ash, right? It was, it was just nothing was left. Uh, and we were not the only people affected. The entire data center burned. It was like hundreds of thousands of domains were just off the air, things like that. But because of Scylla's multi-data center topology, um, they also ran in two other data centers. And there was a complete copy of the data at each of the, of the three data centers. And so even with two of the three data centers running, they were able to maintain their service level agreements uh, and totally run with nonstop operations. Like the, the people trying to get on a flight that morning had no problem. People trying to book flights, no problem. They, they, everybody was able to, 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 to get where they were trying to go. Uh, it was a very big uh, travel company in Europe uh, that had this issue. And so, but fortunately, again, multi-data center clustering uh, doesn't, we were able to handle it. Uh, and so there's a lot of other systems that that would have been a complete and total outage. And, and there were hundreds of thousands of people caught up in that fire alone, you know. So that's that's an example of resiliency, uh, high of true high availability. A lot of people talk HA, um, but uh, but then if you actually uh, in fact, this is something that your test audience might want to consider. It's a it's a concept I call uh, the torpedo test. Right. Uh, during World War II, you would fire a torpedo at an aircraft carrier. And, and how many torpedoes would you have to hit that aircraft carrier before it sank under the waves? Right. So when you're trying to do planning, capacity planning for a cluster or high availability planning for a cluster, let's say you set up a, a cluster, a test cluster of six nodes and you fire a torpedo away. Boom. And one node is just taken off that cluster. Can the five handle the load? Can they handle the latency? Can they handle the throughput? Fire away, you know, with torpedo number two. Now you're down to a four node cluster. And you want to check to see when is that system no longer reliable? Like I can't actually keep pumping data into it because, you know, I might lose quorum. Uh, maybe uh, it goes nonlinear in terms of performance. And at this point, I just can't rely upon it to be able to handle my service level agreements. But people should know that before they go into production, 
Uh, and so that's, again, it's just a concept called a torpedo test. And I think people, if they're doing chaos monkeying in production systems, they might want to do some torpedo testing even before they get to production to understand what that degradation uh, envelope would look like. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I was just going to say it sounds like chaos engineering, but obviously it's not in production. So Exactly. It's it's before it's it's because people always do the benchmarking test to see what their maximum performance is, right? Everybody needs to do that. But then they think, you know, they don't do the 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 step back of like, so what if we're not getting peak performance, right? And it's and you should have that as part of like your disaster preparedness planning before you go to deployment, right? Maybe do we need a six no cluster? Or maybe we really would be safer with seven. Do we need it for capacity? No, but we need it for resiliency, you know? So that's the kind of thing I think people need to to have a little bit more proactive thought about. Absolutely. So is there anything built into Cilia that makes testing that type of uh, functionality easier? Well, I mean, Cilia, by by its default, there's a whole bunch of things that is going to make just running it easier. First of all, we're an active-active node uh, type of topology. There's no leader replica model. Uh, and so there's a couple of advantages in that. Number one, you're bulletproof that any one node can be lost and it doesn't matter to the cluster, right? It'll just rebalance a, a, around the existing remaining nodes. Uh, we have uh, anti-entropy mechanisms like um, what's known as hinted handoffs. So if you take a node down for administrative reasons, for whatever reason, and then it might be down for just an hour or two and then you put it back up, um, uh, Maybe you were replacing another software uh, 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 feature, you know, some sort of package that needed to just be updated and you didn't want to be live while you're doing that that update. You can do those administrative changes and the rest of the nodes in the Scylla cluster will keep the live changes. Uh, and then when you join, it's kind of like all you'll get notes passed to you like when you when you had to step out to the bathroom for a class. Right. Hinted handoffs is a great anti entropy mechanism for transient outages. Right. Uh, and then, of course, uh, it has this capability of automatically healing so that if you lose a node permanently and add a node back in, that the cluster will rebalance automatically, auto sharding, right? So you don't have to do any of the manual sharding. These are just, I mean, it's not for testing purposes. This is just how the system operates, which is like really helpful for when you're in an emergency situation. You don't need to panic. The system has these healing capabilities built into it. Um, I think that the other kinds of things that you'll see from Scylla is um, also like it can do tuning based upon the workload. So maybe you're seeing a spike of work that's going on right now. Maybe for whatever reason you have, you know, the thing that everybody's looking up right now. Well, we actually have ways of doing CPU scheduling so that, for instance, um, some of the repair or compaction mechanisms can be stepped back while transactions are heavy. Right. So it has a little bit of I.O. scheduling uh, and CPU scheduling so that it will make sure that administrative tasks aren't sucking up all of the kinds of things, you know, all of the CPU uh, usage when you really need the CPU for transactions. And the last thing we have, which is kind of nice, is let's say you want to have uh, a very transaction heavy workload, but you still want to have some analytics. Right. But but a lot of times when analytics hits a transactional system, those analytics are doing like a full table scan or a range scan. And that's totally going to just gum up the works. Like, what do you do when you're trying to do uh, real-time transactions and suddenly a gigantic full table scan comes in for analytics? And that's, for many other databases, like a panic situation. Like, suddenly you're going to see all those transactions brown out. The, the, the SLAs are going to be blown for, for all of those latencies because the system's being uh, hit by the, by the daily analytics. So what we have is we actually have a feature called workload prioritization so that you can kind of, it's not exactly a rate limit, but you can give shares to the analytics such that they're deprioritized compared to the real-time transactions. And that way you can, you know, you want to keep those SLAs on, on the transactions. I don't care if it takes a half an hour or two hours to run the analytics. I need my transactions to be, you know, single digit milliseconds. That's important, right? So these are kinds of features that are built into Scylla to be from the jump such that it makes it easy to run it as a system. You know, so we've heard that over and over again. I have a toddler at home. I don't need one at the office. <laughs> I want my database to, to not be a toddler, right? I, I don't need to babysit it. 
<laughs> That's great. Absolutely. So, you know, fact one was uh, that you talked about making it more performant was software architecture. The, I guess the yeah. other thing that came into play, you touched on a little bit, was hardware. Um, so, you know, how, how does hardware help? Does it help with CPU, memory? Does it just scale up to infinity? Uh, what's oh, the yeah. hardware utilization that helps with the database? So, so I'm going to step back. I mean, both you and I have the gray hairs to prove that we've been around this industry for a while. And I remember that, that it, it was uh, right once run everywhere was the promise of Java, right? That was the whole thing. And that was back in an era when the operating system you're running on was indeterminate. And the kind of the legacy of Java is that it's right once run terribly everywhere because the, the Java virtual machines, not, it, it, it's like operating on a patient with Waldos, with like these remote systems, because you don't know the hardware you're running on. You're not allowed to. You're in the virtual machine. You can't tell exactly what SSDs you have. Uh, you can't tell... Um, what kind of CPUs you're using or, uh, you know, NUMA awareness. Like there are, by the way, some newer JVMs that are, let's say, NUMA aware, right? They, 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 they are more latency sensitive. And so, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to bash Java overall, but this was always a legacy of Java is that it was one step removed from the code, uh, from, the, from the hardware, from the metal, right? Now, with a system that has access to the OS, uh, to the low-level hardware, you can do some optimizations. So, for instance, when Scylla first runs, we've run a tool already called Disk Explorer that takes a look at the performance characteristics of just whatever SSDs you have. We've recently run them on, let's say, the AWS i4i, which is a brand new system that has these really fast, what's known as Nitro SSDs. Um, they're NVMe SSDs uh, on the of the latest Intel-powered systems that are perfect for like databases. So when we profile that, we have all this logic of how fast, what's the maximum throughput versus concurrency balance, right? You have this performance curve of how much throughput you wanna drive versus how much um, uh, latency you want in, in a database read or write. So we've done all those analytics ahead of time and we have a utility called IOTune that ships with SillyDB so that when you're installing it on a particular kind of server, the IO scheduler will marry its maximum concurrent throughput, its you know the number the number of concurrent uh, the writes that you're doing or reads. It has all that kind of profile of the SSD done ahead of time, so that it can manage that for all of the different CPUs trying to bang on that SSD. Because uh, you know while while we have the equivalent of let's say memory being NUMA aware, right? So that you marry that up with a particular CPU. We don't have the same kind of strict uh, IO controller for like the CPU to a, to a disk. Like we can't do that same kind of partitioning, right? Um, so, so, so we need to make sure that the IO access is carefully balanced across all the CPUs and every, and nobody's, uh, like hogging all the rights. And so another CPU is starved for them. So we have that built into our system as well. Um, but that again, you need to be able to understand what kind of hardware you're running on because, um, let's say an, uh, an N2 Hymem on GCP is going to have very different SSDs than what you're seeing on the i4i on AWS. It's just very different hardware. So uh, that's just one example. Is that's just the SSDs. Then, of course, there's all the optimizations. Are you running on, let's say, a Graviton 2 or a Graviton 3 for AWS? Those, those are completely different. Uh, those are ARM-based chips than an Intel-based chips, right? So does your system... Does it know how to get maximum performance out of any of these? And of course, for Java, you're always going to see a Java-based application running at usually less than 50% of CPU utilization. It just doesn't know what to do with it. And so if you're seeing a Java database running at only 30% CPU utilization, that means that 70% of the CPU you're paying for isn't being used. Makes sense. That's crazy. So it almost <laughs> sounds... It sounds like not only does it save money, though, it saves time with testing. Because a lot of times back yes. in the day, I would have to test against all these different configurations and then, you know, optimize and then run the test again to see if it helped. But it sounds like out of the box, this kind of has uh, almost pre-configured, uh, knows how to run on certain uh, configurations. Yes, yes. And we so we've done as much as we possibly can to make sure that the, the, like, the most well-known public cloud servers that we know about, we've tested those against. Right. 
Uh, and and then of course you know if if you want to Disk Explorer is free you can go uh, to GitHub and get Disk Explorer and run it like if so if you're running on on premises kind of like build your own boxes you can at least run Disk Explorer against that right perfect all right so I think we covered hardware we covered software architecture the third one you went over was interoperability so how how does yes. that come into play it, it's so huge it used to be that let's say again we're, we're we're the gray beards here so back in the day you would buy one database to rule them all right oracle erp and that like everything was in oracle erp and you had no other databases or you tried to pretend that there were no other databases in the company right but these days people are making purpose-built applications using maybe SQL for some workloads, they're using NoSQL for other workloads, and they might even have multiple different NoSQLs running in the same shop. You might have, for instance, a shopping cart might be built in SolidDB. You might have a graph database, and you'd have your own special flavor of graph database for, for like uh, relationship awareness and you know, things like that, or uh, sentiment analytics on social media, right? So, so there are large companies that are literally running over 100 databases. And so you need to make sure that they're interoperable, at least with the kind of a data bus that people are using across their companies. Uh, there's still a lot of ETL kind of back and forth between databases, but more and more these days we're seeing event streaming. You're seeing the Kafkas or the Red Pandas or the Pulsars of the world. And so your database needs to be able to plug into that both as a sync, as a consumer of data coming from other databases, as well as being able to be a source as a producer of data so that other systems can can uh, uh, can take advantage of it. And I'm thinking about one telecom right now that has a SolidDB instance uh, working um, and they have a ton of data coming into it from an upstream Kafka topic. They then push it out sideways to a kind of a sideband conversation where it gets enriched and then brought back into Scylla with that enrichment through Kafka. And so it's a so it's a subscriber once, and then a producer, and then a subscriber again, and then it downstream produces to yet a a, a tail end kind of reporting system. So Scylla is it's not like just two tin cans in a string. You're having these complex conversations with your data, complex pipelines, and your system has to be able to work in real time constantly with those kind of uh, fleet based mechanisms. Does that help if someone's trying to move over to your system from say Oracle? Because uh, they could do it slowly with, with this approach? Yeah, so there's two th things that happen these days. One is that there's some people that just build, you know, Greenfield or they Brownfield on NoSQL, right? They're, it's just, it's a denormalized system and it just may have to send results over to a, a SQL system. Uh, or people may be doing like offload, right? Where they're taking certain workloads that currently, like we had a, a company that was doing GPS, a lot of GPS data for real-time trucking and Oracle was just an anti-pattern for that because it was all transaction oriented and uh, it couldn't keep up with the on the fly updates that you were getting from all these trucks constantly moving all the time. And like Oracle was just not the right place. So they made a NoSQL system to keep track of all that telemetry data, which was, you know, like a time series uh, uh, sort of system. So Scylla was that. And then when the trip was complete, boom, you send back the results to the Oracle database, you know, truck rolls you know, and then trucks complete, like all it needed to know was the beginning and the end of it. Uh, it didn't really need to know every single step that the truck made along the way, right? So I think that's what we're seeing a lot of. There's a lot of these hybrid systems where Oracle, SQL, and other SQL systems and NoSQL systems, they're all in, they're all s s staying with the same corporation. Uh, and in fact, you know, now the other thing that we're seeing is people doing multi-tenancy where they're sharing their databases with other companies, right? Uh, and maybe they're using a Pulsar or they're using a, a, a Kafka to share out those topics to consumers that are not beyond your enterprise. Very nice. All right. So I guess the fourth fact then would be RASP. What's RASP? Yeah. So RASP is, it's an older term, hardware term kind of thing. It stood for reliability, availability, serviceability, and performance. Uh, it can also sometimes be rendered as scalability for that S, right? So, but these are all the illities, the qualities of a thing. It's not really a feature. It's not a function. It's 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 a, it's a quality of a system. Uh, and this was used to, for instance, reliability. I, I, we just talked about that 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 ca uh, case study with the with literally a data center burning down and it was still operating. Um, using the high uh, availability of the two other systems. We talked about availability also, and that's, for instance, in databases, is can this database be partitioned? So let's say North America 
and Europe lose their connection? Can you still be doing, let's say, a local quorum within each of the continents? And so they're still able to operate. Uh, and even though there's a partition between the two different elements of the cluster, you're still having highly available, highly performant local access. And then the database will heal once that network partition is fixed. That's an important function for a lot of people that want to be running globally available kinds of systems. Uh, let's say a mapping company wants to have, again, they, they want to have maps of Tokyo in Tokyo. Why am I, why am I serving, um, you know, for this mobile user, why am I serving a map of Tokyo out of London? It's just an anti-pattern, right? I'm limited literally by the, by the latency of the speed of light between here and London. So I want to give local access. And if there's a network partition, I don't care. The person in Tokyo shouldn't care. They should, they should get map tiles served right out of Tokyo, right? So all of this goes into uh, that element of availability. For serviceability, we've been talking about just making it easier. So many databases are complex and they're frightening for developers. Even if you do them as a database as a service, it's like, I don't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole. You know, they, they want to have an API to write to. Uh, and then on the back end, uh, again, databases as a service is a wonderful way to, to make it generally serviceable. But what happens when a database is not performing to, to, to your uh, heart's content? Is it easy to troubleshoot? Do you have the observability tools built into this? Do you have the manageability tools built into this? Uh, and all that goes into serviceability. And finally, performance. Again, if you need a system that has to have single digit milliseconds, needs to scale the terabytes or beyond, needs to be able to support hundreds of thousands or millions of terabytes, there's some of these things that you can throw money at to scale. But there's other things like latency. It's got to be built to perform. Very simple. So, yeah, so for serviceability, uh, you know, developers are getting more and more on that plate that they have to deal with. And yes. so... Um, a lot of times it used to be like a, a database admin. He was like the god of the company. Uh, exactly. But it sounds like <laughs> sounds like almost this makes it so it's uh, a dev more dev friendly. Am I understanding that correctly as well? Yeah, yeah. You want to make sure that the developer experience is really um, uh, very. It's it's facile to them. So, for instance, just as an example, a lot of NoSQL databases decided to at the same time that they wanted to do, let's say high availability architecture and all this goodness for you know cloud-based services they also decided to throw at you a completely orthogonal query language right on top of all this make sure that everything i've ever learned about sql is absolutely useless <laughs> and so they go like i don't i don't i don't even know how to write queries right now, fortunately, for like people who are used to Cassandra or used to, let's say, Datastax Enterprise or SolidDB, they use a thing that's SQL-like. It's called CQL, Cassandra Query Language. Now, it doesn't support table joins. It doesn't have all the features and functions of, of you know, ANSI SQL. But for a passing, a person who's got passing familiarity with SQL, it's not as intimidating, right? It's going to seem more facile. It, you don't have to wrap your head around it. Now, I'm also going to point out, though, that there's a lot of people that have grown up in a world of JSON, and they're like, SQL, what are you even talking about, right? <laughs> and so for them, something like uh, uh, the Amazon DynamoDB S uh, SDK is far more familiar because it's at least, it's, 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 it's basically tossing JSON at things, right? I can wrap my head around that. So, with, so fortunately, SillyB supports both uh, a DynamoDB SDK uh, point of view, and it supports that more traditional CQL point of view. So however you prefer your query language, we support both. Great. And so the last factor was deployment. Yes. Can this run where I need it to run? Because everything I've told you before now means absolutely nothing if you cannot deploy it on my favorite cloud, right? And now here in North America, we might be more familiar with the AWSs or Azure's or Google Cloud. Um, but overseas, there are any number, like I talked about OVH Cloud, that's big in France. There's there's cl cloud providers in Asia. And so sometimes running on a DBAS is really convenient if that's your favorite cloud, but it could be a lockout if it's a single vendor cloud 
And I just, I'm not going to be able to run that in where I'm running right now, whether in Asia or Europe, et cetera. So you want to have something that's deployable maybe on premises these days. I know that that's a crazy thing, but there's still a lot of people running on premises gear. Uh, in fact, I don't know if you knew this, but there is, there is an extension of AWS. They call um, AWS uh, Outposts. And it's a cage that Amazon deploys on your data center at your site. And it's all AWS gear inside. And in fact, it's an extension of AWS, but it's running on premises. And people need that for data governance or localization purposes, a whole lot of security reasons. They say like, no, 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 that's great. We don't want it in, in uh, US East one, or we don't want it in US West. We need to have this as an extension on our premises for various purposes. The crazy thing about that is that SillaDB will run on those. It'll actually run a SillaDB cloud but running in those outposts. So it's a fully managed DBAS on premises. <laughs> but that's an example of the flexibility that people want. Mm. And I can see as more and more we're going cloud first, people are making the transformation to the cloud. This is like the need for that is, is more and more uh, critical. Right. And that's another thing too, is that people want to span from on-premises you know, so they yep. have a hybrid cloud scenario, yes. right? So the awesome thing I just talked about with the multi data center deployment, right? You get that built in for silly to be. It's not an extra costing. If you want to have some of these uh, nodes on premises, and that might be where you run your analytics is like, I'm going to have a, a data center that's like, I'll run my analytics locally. And the transactions are all out on AWS or Google Cloud. You can span your cluster across both of those uh, deployments. And, and, or maybe internally you're doing uh, some sort of internal uh, data enrichment, right? So you're getting feeds from internal uh, and you don't want some of those feeds to be out on the public cloud. So, but that's the awesome thing about SillyDB is you can kind of control that and still consider it a single logical cluster. Peter, I've got one question and maybe it's obvious, but maybe it's not. Is this open source or do you have an open source solution? Because it sounds like if people want to get started, I assume if you have an open source version, that'd be a yes. good place to start as well. So yes, you can get started in Docker today with Silly to be open source and it is completely open source. So if you want to deploy that to your favorite cloud or on-premises environment, Silly to be open source is fully functional. It is not crippleware. It is uh, it, just like, again, an Apache Cassandra, it's completely open source uh, software. If you want to step up, then we have SillyDB Enterprise, which has got some additional features, which might save you some money. Uh, when when you take a look at incremental compaction, we can we can definitely make sure that you're getting the maximum utilization out of your hardware with uh, SillyDB Enterprise. And the last thing we have is if you just want to be a developer and you don't want to get your hands dirty with backups and repairs, we have SillyDB Cloud, which is a fully managed DBAS. So again, you can get started for free, and then uh, you know we'll scale and and work towards your budget. Okay, Peter, before we go, is there one piece of actual advice you can give to help someone with their database performance efforts? And what's the best way to find, contact you, or learn more about Cilia DB? Right. Well, people are asking me to help them actually troubleshoot their real-time production environment. Something's gone desperately wrong. But I would recommend that everybody go to Cilla uh, uh, DB University. It's university.cilladb, that's S-C-Y-L-L-A-D-B.com. We have all of our education and training is free and online there. Uh, and then another thing I'd, I'd recommend is that people are interested in getting their feet wet, not just in SillyDB, but anything in terms of uh, uh, big distributed systems that need to run at low latency. There, We have an upcoming event called P99Conf, and you can register at p99conf.io. Uh, uh, it's completely free. It's online. Uh, we have uh, nearly 7,000 registrants already. We're expecting between eight and 10,000 registrants for the event. And it's not, again, it's going to be all sorts of databases, but streaming event systems, uh, application architectures. For anybody who's interested in this kind of uh, career, uh, I would say it's, it's definitely an event you want to check out. Thanks again for your performance testing awesomeness. The next everything of value we covered in this episode, head on over to testguild.com forward slash P96. And while you're there, make sure to click on the Try Them Bolt Today link under the exclusive sponsor section to learn all about SmartBear's two awesome performance test tool solutions, Load Ninja and Load UI Pro. And if the show has helped you in any way, why not rate and review it in iTunes? Reviews really do matter in the rankings of the show and I read each and every one of them. So that's it for this episode of the Test Guild Performance and Site Reliability Podcast. I'm Joe. 
My mission is to help you succeed with creating end-to-end full-stack performance testing awesomeness. As always, test everything and keep the good. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Test Guild Automation Podcast. Head on over to testguild.com for full show notes, amazing blog articles, and online testing conferences. Don't forget to subscribe to the Guild to continue your testing journey.